Hello everybody, Void here coming back at you all with another Commander Deck Tech for Zendikar Rising. We're going to do Rogue Tribal with Anawan the Ruin Thief. This is from the Commander deck. So there was a Rogue deck and there was a Landfall deck. This was separate, so obviously not in the main set. But Rogue's got a lot of support in Zendikar Rising, so it's interesting to try and build a deck around them. They play very similarly to Ninjas. I will say there's more of a focus on just evasion. Not so much ninjutsu-like abilities where you're cheating stuff into play. But some of the abilities that these rogues have when they deal combat damage are actually pretty powerful and you can also incorporate a mill strategy if you want to. I didn't really choose to go with heavy mill, I just wanted to take advantage of some cards in graveyards. You can easily bring creatures back from the graveyard. You can also cast instants and sorceries from the graveyard. So it's not going to be a pure mill strategy, just having fun with rogues. And this is still pretty early, haven't had a chance to actually play with any of these cards yet, so it's going to be raw, not possible polished. But Anawan the Ruin Thief, for those of you who do not know, is a 4-mana blue-black vampire rogue to 4 other rogues you control get plus 1 plus 1, so it's a little anthem there for them. Whenever one or more rogues you control deals combat damage to a player, that player mills a card for each 1 damage dealt to them. If the player mills at least 1 creature card this way, you draw a card. So that's consistent enough, it's not going to be overwhelming card draw, but it's enough to make it worthwhile, maybe speed your deck up just a little bit. I think if you want to go for pure mill you could also do that i just wanted to stick with rogues i think there are a lot of rogues with pretty decent abilities not all of them being mill so you want to take advantage of those too so going over the boring part of the deck the lands nothing super special we do have some support here for tribes we have cavern of souls obviously to make our rogues uncounterable if we want to cast one we have path of ancestry to scry one if we want to cast a creature that's the same type as our commander which spoiler alert <laughs> that's going to be every creature in our deck we have Reliquary Tower, so we don't have to discard. We have Rogue's Passage, which doesn't really do anything for Rogue specifically, but it makes a creature unblockable, pretty much. It's not something I would say is that necessary. A lot of the creatures we already have, a lot of our Rogues are already unblockable. We have some ramp cards in here. This is probably a weakness of blue-black, is that there's not a lot of ramp. But we do have the Soul Ring, Mind Stone, Dimmer Signet, Arcane Signet, and Talisman of Dominance. And the reason why I'm going lower on the ramp is because we do have a bunch of cheap creatures, like one cost, two cost creatures. It's not going to be a huge problem for the deck, seeing as a lot of these creatures will also help us draw cards, so we can get through the mana we need. But uh, if you wanted to add something in like a Wayfarer's Bobble, maybe a Burnished Heart, or even a Solemn Simulacrum, feel free to do that. I just chose to go with five ramp spells. A big part of the deck that we want to focus on is Evasion. We have ten creatures that are in some way going to provide evasion either by giving it to other creatures or they themselves have evasion. This is most of the time going to be unblockable, flying, sometimes island walk, and there are other creatures in the deck that can be unblockable, but these are going to be primarily the ones you look to early in the game. Changeling Outcast, one drop. Obviously being a changeling, it can be every creature type, so it can't block and can't be blocked. Ink Fathom Infiltrator, two mana, two one, can't block and is unblockable. Invisible Stalker, Two mana hex proof is unblockable. Keeper of Keys is an interesting one. It enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. And at the beginning of your upkeep, if you're the monarch, creatures you control can't be blocked this turn. Monarch is going to be pretty decent in this deck. I just know it. I have a feeling. <laughs> When you can easily just attack whoever else becomes the monarch and get it back, not only will you for sure give your creatures unblockable, not only will you for sure make it so that your creatures can't be blocked, but you get the monarch card draw at your end step. So that's pretty sweet too. Looter Ilkor is a looter creature, as you would imagine. But instead of saying it can't be blocked, it has shadow, which is kind of the same thing. Can block or be blocked only by creatures with shadow, which take a guess how many of those exist. So when it deals damage to an opponent, you draw a card and then you discard a card. It's just a 1-1, one, one, but could be worth it for that extra bit of card draw. We have Meringue River Prowler, 3 mana for a 2-1, can't block and can't be blocked. You may cast Meringue River Prowler from your graveyard as long as you control a black or green permanent. So it's an unblockable creature we can keep bringing back because we're going to have some black creatures. We have Slither Blade, another 1-1 one, one for 1 that can't be blocked. We have Tetsuko Umizawa, Fugitive, 2 mana for a 1-3. Creatures you control with power, toughness, 1 or less can't be blocked. That's always nice. Triton Shore Stalker, another 1-1 one, one for 1 that can't be blocked. And Vampire Cutthroat, a 1-1 one, one for 1 with Skulk and Lifelink. Skulk is not as good as just being unblockable, but 
It can't be blocked by creatures with greater power, which I think for the most part you're going to swing in easy at at least one player. We do have a few equipment cards that are going to go well with this strategy. We want to swing in uncontested. Cloak and Dagger, equipped creature gets plus two, plus zero, and has Shroud. So that's nice. It's kind of like a Lightning Grease for rogues. Whenever Rogue comes into play, you may attach Cloak and Dagger to it. Oh, that is so good. Normal equip cost of three, so definitely good that we have a Rogue Tribal deck. We have Sword of the Animus to reward us for attacking with our unblockable creatures. Also kind of a way we get ramp, but I think it would be a good card even if we didn't need to rely on it. Whisper Steel Dagger is a new equipment. Equipped creature gets plus two plus zero, and whenever the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, you may cast a creature spell from that player's graveyard this turn, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast that spell. So kind of like what another card in this deck does, maybe not as well, but we're going to get to that later when we talk about our graveyard synergies. We do have some anthems here just to make our combat a little bit more powerful. In addition to Anawan, we get other plus and plus ones from Adaptive Automaton. We get uh, a lot of power and toughness for each rogue we have with Coat of Arms. And Obelisk of Erd is a Convoke artifact, but it gives plus two plus two to all of our rogues. We obviously want to choose rogues. We have one generic rogue card. I didn't think it really fit into any category, but we have Frog Tosser Banneret. Like the other Bannerats, it gives cost reduction for certain creature spells, goblin spells, and rogue spells you play cost one less to play, so that's pretty sweet. We do have some card draw here to speed up the deck, since we're going to be dealing combat damage pretty easily. Biden of Thassa, as well as Reconnaissance Mission, I think are going to be essential. It counts whenever a creature you control deals combat damage, which that alone shouldn't be hard to do in this deck. We have Distant Melody, we can choose a creature type and draw a card for each permanent we control of that type. So if we have a few rogues out there, we can draw a few cards for four mana. We have Ghostly Pilferer, a spirit rogue. When it becomes untapped, you can pay two mana if you do draw a card. Whenever an opponent casts a spell from anywhere other than their hand, you also draw a card. And you can discard a card. Ghostly Pilferer can't be blocked this turn. So it's a little bit of everything that you could want in a rogue deck. You get to draw cards when you need it. You get situational card draw, and you can also make it unblockable. Notion Thief can be a powerful card. It could also be pretty risky, considering that the card draw is not a may. But if an opponent would draw a card except the first one they draw in each of their draw steps, instead that player skips that draw and you draw that card instead. So if your opponent plays a Brainstorm, you get two cards, they just keep that one. Unless it's their turn and you're responding to their Brainstorm with a Notion Thief. It does have Flash, so it's a pretty sweet spell. We have Rankle, Master of Pranks, versatile creature, can of course provide card draw, but it's going to provide a little bit of everything, make each player discard a card, you can also make each player sack a creature. Flying Haste 3-3, Fairy Rogue, that can easily deal damage to players, I think it's going to be pretty useful in the deck. We have Sure-Footed Infiltrator, 4 mana, tap another untapped rogue you control, Sure-Footed Infiltrator can't be blocked this turn, and whenever it deals combat damage to a player you can draw a card. So pretty sweet right there. We also have Sieg River Cutthroat. And end of turn, if an opponent lost three or more life this turn, you may draw a card. If there's something that's causing opponents to lose a lot of life, you're going to be drawing a bunch of cards off of this too. So card draw, suffice it to say, is not really a big problem. We do have some tokens, and I didn't realize this before, but these are fairy rogue tokens from Bitter Blossom. I used to just think they were fairies. So at the beginning of your upkeep, you lose a life, and you put a 1-1 black fairy rogue creature token with flying onto the battlefield, making it even easier to deal damage. They're also going to get plus one, plus one from Anawan. We get Marsh Flitter, which again, another big surprise for me. Those tokens are rogues. They're black goblin rogue creature tokens. Marsh Flitter itself is also a rogue. Same thing with Una Queen of the Fae, the tokens are fairy rogues. Unfortunately, Una herself is not a rogue, she's a fairy wizard, but you could still get a ton of value out of this just by putting a bunch of those fairy rogues onto the field. We do have some steel abilities. We have Agent of Treachery. Enters the battlefield, you gain control of target permanent, and at the beginning of our end step, if we control three or more permanents we don't own, we draw three cards. Going to be easier to accomplish this in more than just one way. Obviously, we have our graveyard synergies, which will help us out. We have Gati, Lord of Luxury, which is a rogue. <laughs> Pretty good rogue and commander. Also has Death Touch, so should be easy to deal damage. Master Thief. When Master Thief enters the battlefield, gain control of target artifact for as long as you control Master Thief. We also have Thought of Adele, Inquisitor, also another creature with evasion built in with Island Walk. Whenever And whenever she deals combat damage to a player, you search that player's library 
For an artifact card and exile it. Then that player shuffles their library until end of turn. You get to play that card. Really powerful. I love all of these abilities where you can search an opponent's deck. And just mess with their combos. This used to be fun to do with cards like Paradox Engine. You can still do it with Aetherflux Reservoir. Very good card. Thieving Skydiver. You can steal artifacts. Has that kicker cost. But is also technically a rogue with flying. So will fit in pretty well with the deck. We have a couple clone cards we can copy creatures. Glasspool Mimic can enter the battlefield as a copy of a creature we control, except it's a shapeshifter rogue in addition to its other types. Can also flip into a land if you need it. Stolen Identity is a pretty sweet card. Cypher is an ability that we need to see more of. It's been quite some time. We create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature. Cypher means once we have this on a creature, if we deal combat damage with that creature, we get another copy of Stolen Identity so we can keep copying artifacts or creatures. Overall, it's a pretty sweet card. We do have Prowl, which is a unique mechanic for mostly rogues, but uh, we also see the inclusion of Sphinxes with Enigma Thief, and Prowl is just pretty much cost reduction if you dealt damage with a rogue, but for Enigma Thief, that's also extended to Sphinxes for some weird reason. Has flying, and whenever it enters the battlefield for each opponent, return up to one target and on land permanent that player controls to their hand. We have Knowledge Exploitation. This is a pretty powerful card. So if you deal damage with a rogue, it's only 4 mana. We search target opponent's library for an instant or sorcery card. We may play that card without paying its mana cost. Then that player shuffles their library. So another steel card. We could also put this in that category, but I think the Prowl is a little bit more notable. We have Latchkey Fairy. When it enters the battlefield, if its Prowl cost was paid, we draw a card. Just another Prowl Rogue that we can put out there. 3-1 with Evasion, so... We're going to get our card draw. We're going to be able to deal some more damage. Notorious Throng, another pretty powerful card. The Prowl cost is 6 mana. We put X, 1-1 one, one Black Fairy Rogue. Creature tokens with flying into play where X is the damage dealt to your opponents this turn. If Notorious Throng's Prowl cost was played, take an extra turn after this one. So you get extra turns and a combat-focused stack. That's always going to be nice. We have Stink Drinker Bandit, Prowl cost of 2. Whenever a rogue you control attacks and isn't blocked, it gets plus 2, plus 1 until end of turn. The Prowl cost doesn't really add anything to it other than just making it cheaper initially. And then we have Thieves Fortune. This is just going to be more of a look at the top 4 cards of your library, put one of them into your hand and the rest on the bottom in any order for 1 mana if you have Prowl. So it's just more flavor for the deck. It is technically a rogue card. We do have a few counter spells. We have counter spell, obviously. We do have a few counter spells. We have counter spell, obviously. We have fierce guardianship. We have Silumgar's command, a little bit more versatile, but again, it's going to be able to counter non-creature spells. We also have Swan Song to deal with enchantments, instants, or sorceries. So we've got a little bit of control here. We do have a few mill cards. We have Merfolk Wind Robber. When it deals combat damage to a player, that player mills a card. We can sacrifice it to draw a card and activate this ability only if an opponent has 8 or more cards in their graveyard. Very good value for just 1 blue mana. We have Soaring Thought Thief for 2 mana. We have a 1-3 Flash Flyer. As long as an opponent has 8 or more cards in their graveyard, rogues we control get another plus 1, plus 0. Whenever one or more rogues you control attack, each opponent mills 2 cards. That's pretty powerful. We also have Thieves Guild Enforcer from M21, 1 mana, 1-1 one, one with Flash. Whenever it or another rogue enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent mills two cards. It's almost like they knew exactly what they were going to do this year and what kind of synergies you could expect. We also have a few removal spells. We have Cyclonic Rift. Drown in the Lock could also be a counter spell, but whatever, it's in one of the categories. We have Necromantic Selection, which is a great board wipe, but we can also bring back a creature from a graveyard, which is nice after you're done milling all of your opponents. We have Reality Shift to exile a creature, and we have Toxic Deluge to pretty much be an all-around effective board wipe for creatures. Just very nice to have for only 3 mana. And the last section of the deck before we wrap it up here, is our Graveyard Synergy. We have a few cards in here, obviously not the only cards that deal with the Graveyard, but we have Memory Plunder. After you're done milling, you can for just 4 mana cast a target instant or sorcery card from an opponent's graveyard without paying its mana cost, which I think is absolutely wonderful. There are some pretty expensive instants and sorceries, so pretty much casting it for free after paying the 4 mana obviously could be really effective and game-changing. We have Mnemonic Betrayal, kind of like a Yawgmoth's Will, but for your opponent's graveyards. 
Again, in a mill strategy, something like this is going to be even more powerful. Surprisingly, though, it hasn't quite had the impact in Commander I think a lot of people were expecting. Again, Yagmas will, very similar card. I don't know, it just never caught on. We have Nighthawk Scavenger, Flying Death Touch Lifelink. Not really going to bring anything back from the graveyard, but its power is equal to 1 plus the number of card types among cards in our opponent's graveyards. Also, just having a ton of awesome keywords, I think, is very good in a combat-focused deck. We do have Zara Sand. This is the card that's going to bring back. We kind of do a ninjutsu-like trick where we can return an unblock attacking rogue to our hand in order to put Zara Sand onto the field. If it deals combat damage, we get to put target permanent card from that player's graveyard onto the battlefield under our control. So very sweet rogue option. I was even considering this for the commander until I read the first part again and it said you have to put Zara San from your hand onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. So you could make it work, but it'll be kind of a pain to do that. But anyway, guys, let me know what you think about Anawan the Ruined Thief. Rogues are pretty cool. It's kind of like what I wanted to do with Ninjutsu. And you can kind of see a little bit more consistency with rogues. You don't have to rely on other creature types. That was an issue I did have with ninjas was that you had a bunch of unblockable rogues in a ninja deck. So it was kind of like, where's the flavor here? I think this is definitely a cool deck. But anyway, you guys have a wonderful day. Void here signing off. See you all next time.